Eat, eat it. Eat it. You're listening to the Eat It podcast. Brought to you by Feathertail. Yum. Yum, 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 yum. Hello and welcome to the first Eat It podcast. I am Brianna Goldberg, one of the co-editors of Eat It, which, in case you didn't know, is a collection of writing. It's 31 pieces of irreverent, clever, touching, genre-spanning stories that explore what it means to be a woman who is hungry for more. And it looks at how food is caught up with things like love and power and biology and social obligation, nourishment and pain and pleasure. And then we cover it all with some really delicious, gooey pizza cheese and we bake it into until it's golden brown and perfect. And who do we have to thank for this? We have to thank our amazing publisher, The Feathertail Review. And uh, I'm going to try and convince you. In the couple of weeks leading up to our launch, I am going to invite you to join me for a little bit of time. You know, just the time that you take walking to work. The time that you take just going for a brief little jog or cooking your dinner. That would that would be perfect. You can hang out with us while you cook your dinner. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the contributors to our book and I'm going to introduce you to some of the ideas that are driving their work and hopefully that will convince you and then you can join the eat it party and we'll all have a big heaping plate of delicious eat itness together and that will be a wonderful delightful meal. So later in the podcast, we're going to do a brief little check-in with my co-editor, Nicole Bowdy, who is actually in Ghana right now doing some volunteer work. Uh, and I, meanwhile, am here in Toronto. I'm waiting for my uh, beef stew to be ready. It's been simmering for a while now, but uh, I think we're probably about probably about 20 minutes out till it's ready. So in the meantime, let's just, let's hang out and let's listen to our first interview with our contributor named Jessica Moss. Uh, Jessica's an actor and she's a playwright on the Toronto scene. You've probably seen her around. She's been in shows at Luminato with the Necessary Angel Company. She's been in some stuff at Tarragon and her own work has been produced at um, the Next Stage Festival and she's like a staple at the Fringe Festival. In fact, it's just this past year at the Fringe Festival in Toronto Toronto, her existential comedy, which is not an easy thing to pull off, uh, it got her on the front page of Now Magazine uh, because they were so excited about it. And then it was called Polly Polly, by the way, I should mention that to you. And then uh, Polly Polly won her the Ed Mervish Award for Entrepreneurship because so many people came to see her play. It had it was the best attended play in the whole fringe, and we were so lucky that somebody so talented was uh, willing to share their work with us for Eat It, and we were even more lucky that. She then came over to my house and was willing to talk about it. I did. I lured her with promises of some wine and some snacks. And so uh, Jessica came over and we sat on my little green couch over there. And she started out by telling me a little bit about the piece that she wrote for Eat It. I wrote a piece called The Dinner Show. And it is a play, a very short one person with help play that's never been performed. Um, and I don't actually know if it can be performed. Uh, and it's kind of a Martha Stewart type hostess who uh, welcomes you into her house and walks you through a, the preparation for a dinner party that get progressively more and more disastrous. Tell us a little bit about how disastrous it gets. Um, so in my dream of how the show would be put on, uh, she's standing in front of a table of the food that she's about to prepare, and the food is all played by a variety of puppets that begin to interact with her in uh, demeaning and destructive ways. So she starts to see tomatoes laughing at her, and um, she starts to be attacked by various food items, and then it cl- it ends with her being... Nope, nope, nope. Okay, I won't have to buy that. the book. Okay, buy the book. Buy the book, or come to the launch party at the Gladstone on October 22nd to find out more. Um, so this is interesting. Um, Jess sent in this piece, and it was like just immediately obvious that we had to include it because it was so just like gut bustingly hilarious. But I think it's interesting that you put yourself in the perspective of a Martha Stewart character because I don't think of you as a Martha Stewart kind of lady. We're you know we're sitting here, we're eating some goldfish crackers. We like to go for hamburgers. Yes. You have not invited me over for a twelve course meal. What what led you to that um, to that character? Um, I wrote the play a couple of years ago. Uh, for, for various um, theater festivals, and it was never accepted. There was never anywhere to kind of go with it. We love um, you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited that it's kind of having a bit of a life because I kind of put it away for a bit. Um, but I think at the time when I was writing it, I was really obsessed with Martha Stewart. I have been since I was in high school. I think she's fascinating. Um, not like, I, I bake and I cook and I like to think of myself as being really crafty and domestic, but I really kind of lack the attention span and willpower to... <laughs> 
do anything um, other than bake, which I do do quite ferociously. Um, but Martha Stewart is a fascinating character to me, this person who's kind of created... Like the jail aspect? Well, or? before the jail aspect, like her, her idea that, you know, perfection is, is attainable, that there are these things that she, the things that she would create would be so, like, heart-crushingly beautiful. I l look at that stuff and it strikes so much that I feel inspired by it and I want to do it, but it also just crushes me with pressure, like the fear of what it is to try to bake a turkey and, like, make perfect little tarts with crimped edges and then have ribbons that have like apples on them that you tie around the apple pie in perfect bows like what she would just be there and like no we're just gonna do this and she's so calm and she wears white i spilled like something on myself just getting here and she would like wear white to bake <laughs> chocolate cakes like no she's very brave that. it's true the thing that keeps popping into my mind is i sent this to you a while ago is gilda radner did this piece on snl where she would talk about what gilda ate um, I'm a huge Gilda Radner fan, and uh, she's been really inspiring to me as a performer. And it was initially, it was at the very early days of Saturday Night Live, and uh, I read about it in uh, there. They have a great kind of oral history of uh, oh, the I show. Oh, I about that. It's yeah. a really wonderful book. Um, and uh, they talk about how, like, Laura and Michaels wanted them to kind of just do little things to get people to know the cast members better. And so Gilda does this thing where she says what she ate in a day. And she just, like, she's so charming and so likable, but also really brilliant and funny. And she just kind of talks about what she eats, but um, it's a kind of uh, great little bit. She just kind of says, like, oh, well, you know, I eat that, but I'm being good today, so I didn't eat that. But then I got hungry, so I ate three Twinkies from the bottom of my purse. Like, I'm not doing it right, but there's all that great stuff. Um, she was really influential for me. I'm also a huge fan of Lily Tomlin. Um, so amazing. I don't know if she has anything about food, but definitely about identity and about um, women and uh, the universe, stuff like that. Okay, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna pick you up that thread in a minute. But first, what did Jessica Moss eat today? Oh, okay. So I don't eat breakfast because I'm trying to not eat anything ever. So I felt really good until about 11 a.m. But then I started to get really hungry and I ate. 17 Ritz crackers, which is two and a half servings, and I checked on the box, and a Ritz cracker is like okay. one gram of fat per cracker. It's They're so, so bad. And then there was like a tiny little bit of cinnamon toast crunch cereal in a box, but it was mostly like that crumbled up dust that yeah. happens. And so I put that in a bowl with some 1% milk, and I ate that too. Oh, honey, that doesn't count as anything. And then I uh, went back up to my room, and then I ate two candy sticks that I found in the bottom of a bag that I hadn't opened in a couple candy of weeks. Candy sticks meaning like Popeye? Like, they're like those old-fashioned sugar sticks. They sell them in jars at Bulk Barn. <laughs> um, and then I ate an apple, which was not as good as I had wanted it to be. It was mm. kind of mealy. It was a honey crisp, though, but I think it's a little bit early. Okay. I do love a honey crisp. And then on the way here, I had a small hot chocolate from Tim Hortons that I spilled on myself. I wouldn't have... T I, I, I can't even tell. No, oh, I can't even no, tell either. I should stop me. bringing it up. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Well, um, so now let's pick up the themes of identity and universe and Lily Tomlin, which are quite different from the detritus of your Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Um, what is it? Like, I mean, the thing about Lily Tomlin for me is she's so deep, but it's like she finds humor in these really, really deep places. Is there any favorite memories that you have of pieces that she's done or like some aspect of her work that there's really this admire. wonderful play it's a one-woman show called um the search for intelligent life uh in the universe um it's co-written with her i think partner jane wagner um and uh it's just great like writing partner yeah. or like romantic partner possibly both okay definitely writing possibly romantic okay i'm not sure um but she there are so many like great lines in that where she talks about like language was invented to satisfy our deep inner need to complain um <laughs> I she's can really funny that resonating with your yeah and she plays this um bag lady at one point and she, she does this thing of like uh how do you get to carnegie hall practice and it's just she's so funny and she plays all these characters which has been really influential in my solo work that i like to play lots of different people in one show um and and she did that and did it incredibly well um, so that was the biggest thing. How do you, like, just taking what you admire in her work and thinking about your own stuff, like, how do you find, how do you tread that line, I don't think that metaphor works, of being able to deal with really intense topics, like, 
identity and existentialism, but still keep it funny without, like, how do you keep people from being so taken away by the idea or depressed or confused by the idea that they can, you can still help them find humor in the situation? I think that's kind of the thing that I aspire to. I don't know if I'm successful in it all the time. Um, Lily Tomlin is like, the master of it and I just watched my girlfriend's boyfriend Mike Birbiglia's show I haven't seen that oh my god he does it too where he's talking about like heartbreak and loneliness but it's really really funny um for me it's that if I take a step back like I get very mired in existential angst and my own like very myopic self-serving angst about like who am I and what am I doing and my own problems with the universe but if I take can take one step back from that it becomes very funny like the character of an existentialist is a very funny person, like a very emotive, very sensitive person. It's, it's very funny to like look at yourself through the lens of, um, you know, how ridiculous you are to be so consumed with yourself, to be so paranoid about the world ending, <laughs> which I am. Like someone asked me the other day, like, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm okay. And they went, only okay? And I said, well, we're all going to die someday. <laughs> Like, it's like a theater person. Like, I don't know why I said that, because it's clearly someone who could, like, have power over my career. And I told them that we're all going to die someday. But we are. Good for you for being real. Like, well, if they needed to find that about. information out sometimes. It's great stuff. Like, I love that stuff. Stuff that, like, alternately is horrifying and, like, shakes you to your core, but then is really funny. Like, sometimes I think, like, we're all going to die someday, and it gives me the license to be ridiculous and, you know, do whatever I want. And sometimes, like, I walk around just terrified, because, like, everything is temporary. The whole universe will evaporate into nothing one day. Can you write in those moments, or do you need distance from it? No, I can write in both of those moments. I think my better stuff... My better stuff usually comes from the darker moments, and then I go back and edit in a lighter moment. Right. And you can see the humor. Yeah. In perspective. Because that person, like, that very dark person is, is very funny. And, I mean, my, I'm someone who, like, struggles a lot with uh, feelings of anxiety and depression. And, like, when I'm in them, they're awful. But even when I'm in them, like, there is a part of me that can look at myself and go, like, how funny it is, like, when I lie in bed and eat potato chips and cry all the time. Like, that's really funny. Oh, the image that's... of that is hilarious. <laughs> Even though it's so painful to be the person who in eats chips crying have, in bed, yeah. but it's very funny to think of myself with like the covers like up here and I'm just weeping. Like, it's nice to have that power of being a narrator and being able to look at things from above. Maybe it's a survival instinct, you know. Maybe it's like finding humor as a way to get through things. And so tied, so tied into that, like you know, we've been talking now about food. Like, I don't know, how does food figure in the rest of your work? I know we've discussed how anxiety and depression figures in the rest of your work is it is it a major theme that you deal with or is it just something that sort of popped up for this um for this piece um i mean i i love food personally and like i'm a baker and i'm always thinking about opening up a bakery as an alternative career path to acting and crying which is currently what i'm pursuing you can still do that at the bakery. <laughs> i'm gonna do them all at the same time um but uh i mean anxiety is a big theme for me and food is very connected to anxiety for me personally I how think. Um, I think for a lot of people, like, uh, the idea of, of weight and eating and these things start very, very early and are things that you worry about and obsess over. And, uh, that's very tied to all the feelings I have of not liking myself or like being socially anxious and things like that. So those things all come together. I don't know if food is explicitly something that I write about, but, but like self, how it affects self image, self image and anxiety definitely are like major themes that I write about and then also like in the piece in eat it it feels like nurturing as well which is sort of a, a whole different way of imagining it think, yeah you know like when I say like food in your work do you think of it how does food affect you as the writer as the narrator or how food would interact with different characters in a piece that you were imagining I mean maybe that's kind of part of like a bigger landscape of what the character is but one thing that I do think that a lot of my characters and that I'm uh, I'm struggling with is this idea of who or what am I supposed to be um, and the relationship to food can I think very is a very 
excellent touchstone for that because mm -hmm. you know you can the aspiration of okay I'll be someone who like provides I'll be a mom figure I'll be someone who is warm like that's tied to someone who can cook someone who offers food or you know I'll be I'll be someone who's exotic I'll be someone who's exciting I'll be someone who's beautiful that to me is very tied for not eating food I'm always mm -hmm. like totally envious of these people who like forget to eat I've never forgotten to eat oh, a day in my jerks. life Honestly. you know um, so I think kind of a relationship to food is very primal in terms of how you construct the identity that you want to be, and that's something that I'm hugely interested in. <laughs> so we know you identify as a foodie. Um, one thing that Nicole and I have talked about throughout this project and with other, a lot of our contributors is this sort of complicated relationship um, to, f to feminism. Like when we talk to women about food and how they think about food and how they relate to food and how they write about food, um, it's, it is tied up with their identities as mothers and their identities as partners and for like I, I can't completely speak for her but um, based on our conversations for Nicole that is tied up in Nicole's um, conception of feminism and her own identity as a feminist and I um, have never really identified as a feminist but acknowledge that a lot of the ideas that I have fit within Feminism. How do you like when I say feminist to you? Is that like a frightening word, or are you like, yes, that's me? Like, how does that how does that label apply to you, or not, or frighten you, or? Um, I consider myself a feminist, and I'm very quick to take on the label of feminist. Um, although my understanding of feminism might not fit perfectly under what the definition is in whatever wave we happen to be in, but I, for me right now, it's important to take on the the name, because I feel that debating about what feminism is and um, whether each of us is a feminism uh, is a feminist. I think it's a bit of a distraction from the actual issue, mm -hmm. which is that women are facing a lot of injustices right now. Mm -hmm. So I take on the mantle because I think that those things are more important, mm -hmm. and when those things are sorted out, or at least you know, as we're moving, uh, if we can move forward on solving those things, then I can say, okay, maybe I don't completely fall under the category of a feminist. Does that make sense? Yeah, like what now, comes to I'm mind like, when you're saying these these issues or, or injustices? Like what do you imagine when you imagine you're taking on this label of feminist? Like who are you looking to I think the, I mean, the, the thing that resonates most strongly for me is the continual argument of, you know, women not being funny and fewer representations of, of women and of different types of women that we see um, that... Uh, being able to provide more images of different types of women in the mass media, that's mm -hmm. something that I am very sensitive to. Um, and it's something that I respond to as someone who's trying to be an actor and also someone who's trying to create roles mm -hmm. for actors. Like, I think of myself in, in one way I'm in, the major I'm in the majority because I'm white and I'm straight. So sometimes when I go to castings, I get told, like, you know, we are looking for diversity. And I'm told that as in a way of saying, so we can't take you because mm. you are not diverse. Okay. But then I respond to that and go like, well, who's me? Because I never saw anyone like me growing mm -hmm. up, right? There were no, there are no girls who look like me. Girls who look like me are not allowed on TV. We shouldn't be seen on stages or on TV. So for me, I still feel it's a political statement for me to cast myself and to cast myself. And I think like a huge step forward for me that I've been unable to do is to cast myself as something other than someone who is nerdy and alone. Mm -hmm. And because I'm like, well, that's all I am. I can't play someone who is desirable. I can't play someone who's sexy. I can't play someone who is popular or smart or anything like that because that's not the girl I look like. Mm -hmm. um, and like while it's annoying to me in myself, it is devastating to me when I think of a younger generation who's going to grow up that way. Right. So I, I feel very strongly in like, we need to put girls of all body sizes in everything. We need to put girls, you know, of all skin colors and all, uh, you know, sexual orientations in every different type of role, in everything. Everybody can be anything. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Do you feel um, any impetus to try and write those kind of characters? Or are you just, you know, do you, do you see that in your future? Is that something you'd like to do or just... I don't know if ever explicitly, like for me, it would be it would be more of a, a sense of like, just cast someone interesting, you know, mm -hmm. in the part. Um, maybe at some point, like maybe at some point it would be something that I'd consider. I think the personal is political. I think like there's a, 
there's a political statement in me getting up and saying, these are the things that I'm going to talk to you about for an mm -hmm. hour. Because I, uh, I think of a lot of theater in terms of the cost of the audience's time. Right. Um, so I go, okay, this is worth an hour of your life. If I'm putting this on stage, it's because I believe it to be worth an hour an of, intention of your finite yeah. life because mm -hmm. we are all going to die someday. <laughs> Got that. Thank you. Yeah, you just previewed that earlier. <laughs> so, um, that's, so I, I kind of feel it's political in that sense. I don't know if I'd ever take on anything explicitly political. My work would probably get produced faster if I did. Yeah. There's a lot of demand for topical subjects. I remember um, listening. Do you, do you listen to This American Life? I have. Uh, not regularly, but sometimes. Um, there was an episode. It was about a playwright. I should send it to you. <clears throat> about a playwright who wrote this very important piece. I believe it was a hymn. I believe it was a uh, writer of Cuban descent of some sort. And it was like a political love story and it talked about the politics of growing up in Havana and it talked about how it was all interconnected with personal relationships and it was a really beautiful piece and it was optioned as a film and then it was like put away in the back mm -hmm. of a desk forever until it was until that little drawer was opened up and the script was pulled out and then became Dirty Dancing 2 no. Havana <laughs> Oh my gosh. True story. Wow. So well, you, you could I'm going to start writing about my childhood <laughs> yeah, in Cuba. I, I, <laughs> I want to hear more about that. <laughs> was, there, was there cinnamon toast crunch? <laughs> um, so is there anything else that I should have talked to you about that we haven't yet before we turn to listener mail? Um, the only other thing that I think is important to mention is that when you were like, think about, you know, food and, and sex and feminism, this is what we're going to be talking about. The thing that I kept thinking of was when George Costanza eats a hoagie <laughs> while trying to pleasure a woman. Was it a hoagie? or what? It's like a sandwich. Yeah, it was definitely a meat sandwich. I actually don't and know what a hoagie mustard. really is or like a grinder. Like, I don't know these different classifications of sandwich. A grinder is an application this. on telephones oh, where gay men can... <laughs> That I know. That I have studied. <laughs> but a grinder and sandwich lore? I don't know what that is. There's I've like, never heard of that. Well, a lot of them might be American. There's like answer. heroes and hoagies and subs and We're grinders. We're going to look it up on the internet right now. I don't know well, a hoagie came up, it came up as submarine sandwich. Mm, okay. Maybe they're okay. all just the same thing. And under Urban Dictionary, it says Philadelphian word for a sub sandwich. Word likely has origins from Hog Island, which was an island intersecting the Delaware and something else. Mm. So anyways, now I thought perhaps we would turn to listener mail, and since this is the first episode of our podcast, we don't have any. <laughs> However, we did call out on our Facebook, which you can find at facebook.com slash eatitbook. We heard from listener slash Facebook fan slash contributor to Eat It, Samantha Mara, who wanted us to discuss the following. Samantha says, I would really like to hear about why some foods and which foods are intrinsically funny. The banana, the tomato, the cream pie, and which foods are funny that are not given their due? There's a lot of questions in there. That's, an, that's a great question. I feel like you can really go to town on that. So let's start. Why are some foods funny? And she suggests the tomato, which is something you work with in the dinner show. Yeah, I, I don't know if the tomato is inherently funny. Okay. Actually, I think a tomato is, is it funny because upon we imagine impact. it being thrown at yeah, yeah, I think the tomato <laughs> is maybe uh, connotatively rather than denotatively oh, funny. Do you know you. what I mean? Yeah. Like, a tomato is funny when it's squashed, but I'm not sure if a tomato has intrinsic comedy. It's very round, though. Like, if you put eyes on it, then it's funny. If you put my eyes on anything, it's pretty funny. Yeah. I think, like, a tomato like person is very funny. Like, okay. but I'm trying to picture, like, what a tomato is in terms of personality and like all i can think of is like a red-faced angry man but i don't think that's actually what a tomato is you okay know what I mean? oh, also like a tomato is like a hot tomato which is yeah. like a sexy day mm -hmm. maybe it's like a sexy tomato i just i mean food has personality right uh, our food does either it's maybe it's just because we endow it because we have a very close relationship with the things that we eat like we love the things mm -hmm. that we love to eat um, and we hate certain foods. So maybe it's because of that that food has personality and personality is funny. Mm -hmm. You know? I don't know if there's any other really funny foods. I'm trying Yogurt's funny. Why? Well... Mm, because of the commercials that make you think of women pooping. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, and the idea that women are supposed to love yogurt. The women idea that, do like, love yogurt. I do love yogurt, too, but things. I think it's funny when, like, women dance eating yogurt. <laughs> Well, on their periods. You have well, okay, yeah. That's that's stretching it. That's definitely stretching it. Um, 
you haven't seen me with a yogurt recently. That's one of the things that I, like, you know, you're like, oh, I critique. I critique you images of women in mass media. But when I see happy women eating yogurt, I'm like, you know what? That's true. Really? I love yogurt, but I've never been that happy to eat it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you're not happy. And there's also happy women eating salad. I've never Balkan been happy to eat salad. Yeah. <laughs> never in my life. Suggested to us by listener slash Facebook fan Aaron Marchington was the suggestion... I would like to hear about why some foods are gendered masculine or feminine in Francais and the root of this origin. That's an amazing question. What are your thoughts? I have no idea. Like, why is that? Well, I don't think we can answer that. We're not French no. people. We're not French professors. But can you list me three words that you wish were feminine and give me a reason why? That I wish were feminine? Three food words that you wish were feminine in French and just conjecture why you would like that for Aaron. Okay. Let me think. This is hard. I hope ras are raspberries feminine from was? I don't know. I hope Seems that they like are. They be. feel like they should be feminine. They're so snug and, and, and mm -hmm. adorable. Also, they're my favorite berry. It's like a hug of a berry. I know. They're so great, and they fit so perfectly on your fingers, and then you can yeah. eat them all like this. Like ring mm -hmm. I also hope ring are feminine. <laughs> the ring, -a -lo's are ring -a -lo. <laughs> 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 But we all know that there's never just un ring -a -lo. <laughs> That's true. That's their whole marketing campaign. Tart is feminine, right? Une tarte? I sure. think so. I hope that's feminine. Like, especially a really elegant and sleek I heart. can see that, yeah. Do you know what I that mean? That would be the Martha Stewart. Of the Martha Stewart, but also, like, the Anna Wintour oh, of yes. foods, you know? That's, like, the Vogue powerful still. That's, like, the stiletto of the mm -hmm, food world, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. feel. A really sleek tart with, like, a glossy finish mm -hmm. and a really snappy shortbread crust. It's then just, like, shoved in somebody's face. It's just crammed in there, <laughs> and you dribble the crumbs all the way down. So, as you know, our publisher is... Feathertail, who presents the Feathertail Review, the national magazine award-winning Feathertail Review, which now presents Eat It. And so as a tip of the hat to our delightful sponsor, who we thank so much for taking on this um, project of Eat It, I uh, thought that we would ask Jessica to pick one of her favorite items, um, one of her favorite comic items from Feathertail.com, which is the website of our publisher, Feathertail. You can find links on our website, eatitbook.com to feathertail.com and here is Jessica's recommendation. There are so many great cartoons on this website actually this was tricky but because it so nicely serves our purposes um, I've chosen Le Pain which I also think is pronounced Le Pain by John Martz um, and that is a really great cartoon that combines both French and food, which we've been discussing tonight, and also the pain of being alive, which I feel <laughs> comes across as well. Fabulous. So if you would like to see Le Pain slash Le Pain, head over to Feathertail.com, the website of our, our esteemed publisher, who we thank so much for publishing Eat It. So Jessica, I've taken up far too much of your time today, but thank you so much for hanging out with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was so much fun. And do you have any parting words for our listeners that you'd like to share? Um, just that I've been so honored to be part of this book and to work with you and Nicole, and um, I'm really excited to meet everybody else and uh, read their pieces. So uh, I definitely encourage you to check out all of Edith's stuff online and um, to buy the book when it comes out. Cool. Thanks so much, Jessica. You're the best. Thanks. So Eat It is a very, uh, let's say, internationally influenced snack because on top of the fact that we have contributors from all different backgrounds, be they ethnic or geographic or really any other way that you can be diverse, they are that in this group of 31. But on top of that, um, Eat It was actually produced uh, while I was living in Nigeria and Nicole was living in Toronto and it was produced largely over Gchat and Skype and then... Once I moved back to Toronto, flipped the script, Nicole moved to Ghana for a couple of months because she had some work to do there. So this is just a globe-trotting adventure, really. So, you know, in a perfect world, Nicole would be sitting here right next to me now, chatting with you, introducing the book. It would be great. But she's she's she can't do that because she's off having an amazing adventure. She's hanging out with some roosters and with some elephants. And she was gracious enough to share a couple minutes with us. She gave us a call on her telephone the other day just to let you know uh, what's going on with her. 
Okay, so we have Nicole on the line calling Africa. Nicole, hello. Hi, Brianna. How are you? Good. How's it going? Great. Tell the good people where you are and what you're up to. Well, I'm living in the very busy city of Accra in Ghana where I've been working as a media trainer for the past five or so months. And what does that mean? What are you actually doing there? Well, I'm working at a university with uh, journalism students mostly, and I run workshops, and I do a lot of one-on-one kind of teaching and mentoring with them, and it's been really exciting. And then you've done some other stuff as well, like for yourself and some traveling and stuff like that. Like, tell us a bit about that. Oh, yes. We went to some beautiful beaches. Uh, Last week, I was about 20 meters away from an elephant, Um, who was very old and not really bothered by us, which was cool. And we were surrounded by baboons as well. Um, And, yeah, done some traveling, done some writing, of course, whenever I can. So elephants and baboons, pretty similar to your life in Toronto. Yeah, pretty much. You see all sorts on the streets of Toronto, yeah. (laughs) And there's roosters here as well. (laughs) I was wondering... uh, if you had encountered any interesting foods that you'd like to, that you thought were worth mentioning? People here like heavy food. So a lot of starch. And the, the most popular food here is called, there's two, banku and fufu, which are basically pounded starch balls made with uh, cassava and plantain or corn and plantain. And it's really heavy and doughy and sticky, and everyone loves it. So that was a learning curve, um, even to figure out how to eat it with your hands. Um, so yeah. when when <laughs> when are you coming back to us? Tell me a bit about that. Just a week and a few days now. I'm so excited. Yeah, what are you most excited about once you get back? Obviously, the Eat It launch. Do I even need to say this? I can't wait. You're having the time of your life, but we can't wait to have you back. So thank you so much, Nicole, for talking with us. And we will have a longer chat with you once you get back, and we can sit in the same room and uh, share a glass of wine and some cheeses, perhaps. And um, for now, we'll, uh, we'll let you go and wish you well on your travels home, and we can't wait to see you. So thanks so much. I can't wait to see you, too. Take care. Mm-hmm. So that is it for the inaugural Eat It podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you found yourself interested by the ideas and the artists that we featured today in the podcast, then I think a good thing for you to do would be to buy the book. You know, just just head over, eatitbook.com. You can pre-order right now, or you can figure out where you're going to purchase it from in a couple weeks once it hits your neighborhood, or you can choose to join us at the launch party October 22nd at the Gladstone. I highly recommend it. It's going to be a good time. But in the meantime, please stay in touch with us and send us any questions questions or comments or really any thoughts at all about the podcast. I want to know what you think. I want to make this relevant and interesting to you. I want to talk with you about it. So just just send it on over and get in touch with us. You can find us on Twitter. We're at Eat It Book on Facebook slash Eat It Book, eatitbook.com. I don't think I can say Eat It Book any more times. Uh, If you want to find some more information about our publisher, feathertail.com is the place to do that. Uh, So please send us a note on social media. Weigh in on all the lady and food related stories that we post there on the lady and food related stories that you'll find in eat it and uh, before we go i'd just like to send a shout out to our dear publisher feathertail who's been so excellent and supportive of everything we do thank you to feathertail I'd like to thank Jessica Moss for coming over to my house. It was a very stormy day, and she braved the weather to come over and hang out here. I'd like to thank Nicole for calling us from Africa, because it is not cheap. She called us on her dime, my friend. She called us on her own phone card. So thank you to Nicole Bowdy for doing that. We look forward to you coming home. And I'd like to thank you, of course, for listening and for joining us. And uh, if if you've had a good time, I'd love it if you came back. Next week, we're going to be posting another podcast featuring a conversation with cookbook writer and Toronto star food editor Jennifer Bain. It was a really interesting conversation. She's a fascinating woman. I I really do suggest that you uh, come back for the podcast next week. But until then, uh, do stay in touch. Love to hear your thoughts and please stay hungry. Eat it!